Let's pray. Since you say, Lord Jesus, no one can come to you unless we are drawn by the Father, I ask you and I ask your Father to conspire in this way. And that here and at the North Campus and at the downtown campus Sunday morning, you would draw. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the reasons that we preach straight through books of the Bible at Bethlehem with occasional topical series thrown in along the way is because doing that encourages us to take seriously everything that a book says rather than just jumping here to the thing you like especially here and jumping here to the thing you find easier here and and just navigating your way through the parts of the Bible that you like. You inevitably run into more difficult things when you do it this way and you you run into controversial things and that is certainly the case in this text. I don't uh, go out of my way in worship services looking for controversy. I would much rather exult with you over magnificent truth. That's what worship is. Yes, we want to say yes to truth. We don't want to get bogged down in arguments and quarreling and fighting and grumbling and disagreement. There's a place for fighting for the truth. It's generally not in worship, but If you preach this way, then you bump into these texts and you must tackle what you find. And so what we find here is uh, verse 44, and that's very controversial. So let me read it to you. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. John 6, 44. The non-controversial part of that verse is, I will raise him up on the last day. At least it's, it's not controversial among believers. That's a glorious truth. We saw it mentioned twice last week, once in verse 39, once in verse 40, that uh, Jesus wants us to know that what's at stake here in coming to him is our eternal destiny and whether we'll be raised from the dead or not at the end of the age into life. So that's not part of the controversy, and we lingered over it last time, and I won't spend any time on it now. The controversial part is at the beginning of the verse, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And the reason it's controversial, at least one reason, is because it could mean two different things. Let me give you the two possible meanings, and both of these have been uh, argued for extensively for hundreds of years. The first meaning would go something like this. No one can come to Jesus without God's drawing, and God draws everyone. But only some come. So God's drawing everyone is not the decisive reason why they come. It simply makes coming possible. And then those who come provide from themselves the decisive impulse for the coming. That's one meaning, very commonly argued for. So nobody can come unless the Father draws, and he draws everybody. And the reason any don't come is because they don't provide the decisive impulse from their will, and... The reason some do come is because they do then add to that grace and provide the decisive, that's a very key word in this sermon, decisive impulse. I never mean it as exclusive or only, I just mean the one that's deciding the issue. 
Okay, that's one meaning. Now here's the other meaning. It could mean no one can come to Jesus without God's drawing them, and everyone he draws does in fact come. Because his drawing is infallibly effective. It produces its result. It, he draws and they come. All of them come. And so clearly then he wouldn't be drawing everybody, at least not in the same way. So those are the two possible meanings. Let's try to get the context in front of us and then we'll see if the text settles it for us. Jesus is teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. We know that from verse 59. The resistance over these last verses from verse 1 now to here we are in 41. The resistance is mounting. And it's manifesting itself in verse 41 now as grumbling. A new word will be used down in verse 52, disputing or fighting. It's getting more and more intense. The more he reveals of himself, the greater the resistance seems to be. So let's read verse 41. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know. How does he say, I have come down from heaven? So in verse 33, 35, 38, he has said something to the effect of, I'm the bread of life. I came down from heaven. If you will eat this bread, you will have eternal life. If you come to me, if you believe in me, if you are satisfied in me, feast on all that God is for you in me, you will have eternal life. So come, feast, eat, enjoy, be saved, have life. And the resistance gets greater and greater. Now they're murmuring about how this can be. This resistance here in the form of grumbling um, has a content to it. They say, is not this Jesus the son of Joseph? His father and mother we know. So he can't be from heaven. We know where he's from. He's from here. We know his mom and dad. So the words of Jesus about himself are colliding with the perception and the reasonings of these folks. We see something and we think something about what we see. And the words of Jesus collide with what they think they see and what they're thinking. And this collision produces great grumbling on their, their part. This is a standard collision. It's happening in this room right now. And it will increase over the next 30 minutes. Which is why I prayed that God would come and why Tom prayed that God would come and Chuck prayed that God would come. We know what we're doing here tonight. We know what we're up against here. In the human mind and human perception. So there's this collision between the eyes and the ears and the brains of the audience in the synagogue and what Jesus is saying. I'm bread. I'm from heaven. I give life. If you believe on me, you have life. And that hits their perceptions. We know your mom and dad. You can't be from heaven. Now skip down to verse 47. He reaffirms what made them grumble and the decibels of their opposition increases truly truly I say to you whoever believes has eternal life I'm the bread of life your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die 
I'm the living bread. He's just saying it over and over and over. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he'll have life. Now, so far, nothing new. Just rehearsal of what got them grumbling in the first place. And now comes something more offensive. This is the way the chapter builds. Verse 51, last part of the verse. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And now you've got an allusion to his, his flesh being given on behalf of the life of the world, meaning in death. He gives his, his flesh. And now the grumbling in verse 52, which we'll go to later, not this week, becomes disputing. It's a word in Greek that means fighting. It's getting more intense. It's a bump up a level in the conflict in verse 52. Because now he's getting really particular about his flesh being eaten. Let's go back to verses 43 and 44 and see what Jesus responds, how he responds to this grumbling. Verse 43. Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. One of the keys to understanding verse 44 is to realize that it's a response to this grumbling. Don't grumble. You can't come unless the Father draws you. What does that mean? Let me try to answer two questions. First, what does it mean when he says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him? And second, why would he say it? You know, sometimes people get on the case of teachers or preachers that they say hard things. Well, there it is. And, and so my question is, why would you say that? Don't you know that causes divisions in the church? <laughs> you say things like that, it divides whole denominations. It causes families to get bent out of shape with each other. It just don't, what? You, say something easy. So let's try to answer number one, what, and then we'll do the why question in, in a few minutes. What does Jesus mean when he says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him? I'm going to stay in John. I was really tempted to go to about a dozen texts outside John. But let's just stay in John and we'll work out from, in concentric circles from, from the really close context to the, to the wider context in the book of, of John to try to figure out what he means by this. And I'm going to argue that the near context especially, and then the wider context in a confirming way, makes it really clear that what he does not mean is that he draws everybody. And then the humans provide the decisive impulse for who comes. That is emphatically not what he means, I'm going to argue from the text. Rather, what he does mean is, Everyone that he draws comes. They actually come. And the drawing is the decisive cause for their coming. It's not God's contribution, and then you're decisive. God is decisive in who comes to Jesus. That's what I think verse 44 means. And let me say very clear. This is absolutely, totally, and undoubtedly not in any conflict at all with your coming freely. And by freely, I simply mean because you want to come. Right? I defined freedom last week as doing what you want to do and not regretting it in a thousand years. Nobody comes to Jesus who doesn't want to come to Jesus. 
Nobody comes to Jesus who hasn't chosen to come to Jesus. Nobody comes to Jesus who doesn't come by an act of their own will. I'm just saying, when you perform that act of will, when you experience Jesus as compelling and drawing you freely to himself, there's a reason. God. I'm going to give you five contextual reasons for thinking that's what he means. Number one, go back to verse 37. It's just a few verses away, seven verses earlier. And there Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Now, in the flow of thought from verse 37 to 44, I see no reason whatsoever for thinking that the Father's giving people to Jesus in verse 37 and the Father's drawing people to Jesus in verse 44 are different. They're the same thing. God gives people to Jesus. There. You are his. Now, you were mine, now you're his. That's what it says in John 17. Or, you stand on the other side and he draws them in. He draws them to Jesus. Only we get help in verse 37 because there it says clearly, all that the Father gives me will come to me. So I conclude, and I could just quit and go home now as far as I'm concerned. All that the Father draws come to him. Because the drawing and the giving are virtually the same. I, I would be really hard put to say that the point of verse 37 and the point of verse 44 are dramatically different points. They're not. They're the same point. Number two. Drop your eyes down to verses uh, 64 and 65. This to me is the even more decisive argument in the context for the interpretation that we are seeing. Here, Jesus explicitly refers back to verse 44, and he applies it in a way that makes its meaning crystal clear, I think. Namely, he's explaining why there's a Judas, or other unbelievers, he says, the words that I have spoken to you, this is verse 63, at the end of 63. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, verse 64. But there are some of you who do not believe. Now, John, the writer of this gospel, inserts a parenthesis and says, for Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him, so Judas. So what John is saying is, when Jesus makes the general statement, there are some of you who do not believe, John says, he knows there's a Judas, he's known it from the beginning. Okay? Now we pick it up in verse 65, and here is the explicit reference to verse 44. And he said, Jesus said, this is why I told you, back in verse 44, that no one can come to me unless it is granted him, new word, same meaning, I think, granted him by the Father. Nobody can come unless it is granted. Verse 44 says nobody can come unless it, the Father draws. So the Father gives, the Father draws. And he's explicitly referring back to verse 44. I told you this. I'm telling you why I told you this now. I'm telling you this because of Judas. There are some of you who do not believe. And then notice the logic. This is why. You see that in verse 65? This is why, on account of this, I said back in verse 44, nobody can come to me unless the Father grants him to come to me or draws him to come 
to me. That's why there is a Judas. God did not draw Judas. He, he left him in his greed and his stealing from the disciples and his unbelief and rebellion and hardness of heart. God left him justly and didn't draw him. And that's why I said what I said. I know there's a Judas among you. This is why I told you, so that you would understand how Judas's come about and don't come. A universal offer of drawing won't work here. It doesn't explain Judas. I know there's a Judas that's why I told you God draws everybody. It doesn't work. Number three. Go with me to John chapter 8, verse 47. John eight forty-seven. Whoever is of God hears the words of God the reason why you do not hear them now they're hearing them but they're not hearing them right? hearing they don't hear the reason why you do, do not hear them hear them for what they are hear them truly hear them with joy hear them with reception hear them with eating and drinking and loving and believing the reason you're not hearing them that way is that you're not of God Hearing the words of God in this verse is virtually the same as being drawn or coming, believing. And the reason given for why they don't is because they're not of God. There's a, a prior condition. And they're not in that condition. There, there, there's a prior position of God. If you're of God, you hear. If you're drawn, you come. If you're given, you come. So the decisive cause behind hearing, understanding, believing, coming, is being of God, being called, having it granted to you to come. Number four. Let's go to chapter 10, verses 26 and 27. Chapter 10, 26 and 27 of John. You do not believe because you are not part of my flock. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. What's the decisive cause of whether we believe or not? You do not believe because you're not part of my flock. It's not the other way around. You're not part of my flock because you don't believe. Being a part of the flock is first, and they believe. That's the same as being of God, back in chapter 8, 47. Those who are of God hear my voice. Those who are part of my flock believe. My sheep, that means the flock, hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. That's how you can tell who's a sheep. The sheep hear the master's voice and they follow. If you hear, if Jesus were here tonight and he was saying, I'm the bread. Come, follow me. I've got pasture for you. I've got water for you. I've got life for you. And you're just looking at your watch and saying, I just think I'd like to go. Then you'd know, at least so far, no sheep qualities in you. That's very serious. You are totally dependent on him. We're not playing games here. You are totally 
as a dead person dependent on a life-giving Christ. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me, verse 27, is the same as saying, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And those whom the Father draws come to me. And when we come, I'll say it again, and I'll say it over and over, we come voluntarily with zero coercion. We come freely with zero constraint. We do what we want to do, or it isn't faith. Faith sees him as bread, sees him as life, sees him as treasure, sees him as Lord, sees him as Savior, sees him as all, and says, yes. There's no constraint here. That's the freest moment in your life. And you got that way by sovereign grace. God way, raised you from the dead, gave you eyes to see, opened your heart to be rational for the first time in your life. Before this, we were slaves. Slaves of sin. Slaves of everything, especially me. Slave of me. Because I don't want to be boss, and I don't want to be jerked around, and I, don't, I want to be God. Yes, sir. I want to be God and that's slavery, ultimately. Finally, number five, and this is the most stunning, shocking of all. Chapter 12, verses 37 to 40. Verse 37 of John 12. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. For again Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. That passage does not mean God is drawing all people to himself in the same way way and leaving it with them to provide the decisive impulse. He's not leaving it with them to provide the decisive impulse. Verse 39, therefore they could not believe because scripture is being fulfilled in their blindness. God has given them up. The effect is hardness which for now he does not overcome. Do you remember Romans 11? No, you don't remember Romans 11. So I'll remind you. In Romans 11, verse 25, Paul said concerning the Jewish people, a partial hardening, that is a pardoning upon part of the Jewish people, has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. God has moved away from the Jewish people and given his kingdom to a people bearing the fruits of it. Matthew 21, 43. And here and there, there are little outcroppings of faith among Jewish people. But there will come a day when the hardening will be removed. Did you see? Did you hear the word until? A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. That's what we're seeing in John 12. 
I'm leaving you. You have resisted me. I'm backing away from you. I'm not going to draw most of you. Of course, all of the disciples were Jews. So this is not a total rejection. There are messianic synagogues. There are Jews coming to Christ every day all over the world. But by and large, it is so sad that they don't see their Messiah in Jesus. And there is a blindness. There is a veil, as Paul said, hanging over their face every time Moses is read in the synagogue. But one day, in Christ, the veil will be lifted. We prayed for Jewish people in this room downstairs, because there are people. And I prayed, oh God, grant that this would be the night when the veil would be lifted for them and that they would see him as irresistibly attractive as their Messiah and would come to him and eat and be saved. So with those five parallels, especially the first two, verse 37 and 65, which I think are compelling especially, with those five parallels, let's go back now to... to uh, John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And here's what I conclude. If you have come to Jesus, the Father drew you, which none of us deserves. So let me change the pronouns. If any of us in this room has come to Jesus, we came because the Father drew us to Jesus, which none of us deserved. And if you never come, if you grumble and push it away to the end, it's because the Father did not draw you, and that's what everybody deserves. Therefore, no justice, no injustice is ever done to anyone. Many of you are getting way better than what you deserve. And I pray that none of you will resist the Lord until you're dead. Because then you will get what you deserve and it won't be life. This is the day of salvation. You were brought here tonight because the Holy Spirit is wooing you to himself. Now there's an objection to what I've said, a textual objection. And as I got to this point in my message, I had planned to deal with it in some detail. And I realized there's another thing I've got to answer, namely, why did he talk like this? And I haven't even started on that point of the sermon and if I take up the objection, I won't have any time to do that, so the objection goes to next week, Lord willing. But I'll tell you what it is, and you can, you can think about it. Chapter 12, verse 32 says, Jesus says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all to myself. Says all people. Will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So those who believe very differently than what I've been explaining, that verse 44 means he draws everybody, will argue mainly from this verse right here, 1232. So there you have it. I'll give you the best argument on the other side, and then I'll deal with it, Lord willing, next time. But what I really want to do in, in the remaining few minutes is answer the question, why did you talk this way? What, what do you expect to happen, Jesus? What? No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now, the clue, I think the, the clearest clue is the fact that he's responding to, to grumbling. You see that in verse 43? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. There's, there's something about grumbling that should be undone by this truth. Don't grumble. You can't come unless the Father draws you. There's a connection between skeptical grumbling 
and sovereign grace. They're saying, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he say, I've come down from heaven? So their perceptions and their reasoning are rising up and resisting what Jesus is saying. That may be happening for you. Perceptions, mental inferences drawn from perceptions, it can't be. And Jesus says, you really should stop grumbling because perceptions and reasonings of fallen human beings are never the decisive reason why anybody comes to me, ever. They're important, they have their place. But the decisive reason why anybody comes to me is not their perceptions and their reasons, but me, my father. I think if we probe Jesus a little bit here, he'd say something like, you really should stop grumbling and start praying that God would open your heart. And that's what I would say to you right now anyway. If there are these rising things that just would resist the Bible or resist God or resist Christ, I think Jesus would say, let's just start praying that God would open your heart and give you eyes to see and make you humble before the Word of God and give you a sense, a spiritual sense of why this is a precious thing to know. And So I think Jesus says this, to shake us out of our self-reliant, self-determining, self-exalting, self-absorbed presumptions about our senses and, and our reason and our wills and what they can do. Human beings, by nature, believe our senses, our reasonings, and our wills are omnipotent in deciding to do what we want to do. You see it in kids, and you can see it in the mirror. I can. And Jesus is, he, he gives you words like verse 44 to just shake you. Do you realize how impotent is your will? Do you realize this? Because most of us don't. We go through every day making choices and choices and choices, and we can get the notion my will is quite competent. It isn't when it comes to spiritual things. It is blind, it is dead, and it is hopeless without sovereign grace. And he wants to shake us. Wake up. Don't have those notions about how sufficient yourself is. You're not sufficient. You should be a real self-doubter. So... What does he expect to happen in those of us who come to Jesus when we read this? What does he want to happen? And I'll close by just giving you several responses. And I invite you to experience these responses. This would be the evidence that you've come. If, if you're finding these responses rising up in your heart, it's, it's evidence. I've come to him. He's welcomed me. I'm part of the flock. I'm of God. I'm one of the children because I'm responding this way. Number one, it humbles us. When you read John 5, 44, it humbles us. We didn't provide the decisive impulse to be brought to Christ. God did. We came because of him. If it weren't for his drawing, I would be utterly lost. And now, because of him, I am utterly dependent on free, undeserved mercy. This is, the, this is the stance of a humble Christian. I get nothing good except by grace. I came to him by grace. I'm in him by grace. I'm kept by grace. I'll be raised from the dead by grace. If I do anything worthwhile in life, it's because of grace. 
This is the stance of a humble person. Theology has something to do with humility. Come now, you who say, today and tomorrow, I will go to such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and get gain. You do not know about tomorrow. Rather, you should say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this and that. But as it is in your arrogance, you boast. Just for saying, I'm going home tonight. Having a bowl of cereal in about 30 minutes or 40 or whenever I get there. What do you know about tonight, John Piper? You don't know if you're going to get home. Who do you think you are, God? If you get home, God got you home. If you get shot, God got you shot. God reigns. He's God. He's never dropping the ball. His eyes are never shut. He's never saying, oops. This is my God. This is the stance of the broken, humble human being ready to give all praise to God. Number two. First was humility. Number two, it fills us with thankfulness. Everything I have comes from Jesus. Everything I have comes from God the Father bringing me to Jesus. Oh, how thankful I am for sovereign grace. I tell you, when we sing, if you wonder, why we sing so much gospel here? <laughs> why we sing so much blood? Why we sing so much deliverance? Why do we sing so much God pursuing us? It's because we're desperate people here. If God left us, if God didn't do this for us, we'd be dinking around in this room doing something absolutely pointless. A little game, a little, little club. Scratching each other's back, doing a little self-esteem stuff. Thankfulness. I am so thankful that he saved me. And... and being 63 and gotten, having gotten saved when I was little, I'm, I feel my gratitude mainly for his keeping this rebel. I don't remember too much about getting saved. I was six. But I remember my sins from age 13 to 63. A lot of them. And I can document them every day and he keeps coming back. Keeps waking me up a believer. Keeps me on my face with repentance. Keeps my wife faithful to me. It's not hard for me to see grace in my sinful life, even though I, I can't remember very well how it all got started. Number three, he gives us assurance. If he drew you this freely... If he drew you this omnipotently, he will keep you this freely and he will keep you this omnipotently. And that was last week's sermon. It, it, it didn't take with some people last week. I've talked to people. I, I know this isn't going to take with everybody. We've all been through seasons where we hear something we didn't grow up with. Most of you did not grow up with what I'm saying. This is not the theology you got in your Sunday school class. And this brings you into crisis, and you've got to deal with it. And how many of us can document the tears we shed for months? Fall of 1968, for example. Coming home at the end of the day, putting my face in my hands on my desk and just crying my eyes out because it felt like my world was coming apart because the Bible was speaking so powerfully to my self-exalting theology. So I'm not in a hurry for any of you. Just hang around. Take 10 years, that's fine. It has for some. What didn't take last week was, why would I feel assurance? If it's all up to God, I was like, mm. how else can you have assurance? Why do you think you're going to be a Christian tomorrow? There's only one sure answer. God's going to keep you. Because if that's not the answer, it's on you. That's better. 
That, that's more secure? That's more assurance? I don't get that. I mean, I've got to disconnect there. But when I say now unto him who is able to keep me from falling, to him be glory in the church and in Christ forever and ever. When I, when I say that, I say, yes, I'm laying my head down tonight on my pillow, believing that whether I live or die, I belong to him and he keeps me. So that's number three, assurance. Number four, the conversion of the person you love most who looks most impossible to save. How are you going to believe for that? How are you going to believe for that? Your dad, 83, pagan all his life, got lung cancer, six months to live maybe. Can you believe God? Could, could that really happen? No. Not if it depends on him. Believe me. Not with that trajectory. But if God gets to Jesus, whom he chooses to get to Jesus, you don't have to give up. You don't have to lay that one down. You go to the throne of grace and say, take him. Take him. Get him for Jesus. Please. And you can have hope. What are you going to hope in if God isn't sovereign? If God can't draw him, if God can't give it to him, if God can't give him to Jesus, what, you're going to look for some little clue in his genes or maybe disease will do it or something? He's going to change himself. He's not. But God may. Read 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26 later tonight for how to deal with that situation. I've been there. And people I pray for, and I never let go the sweet, sovereign power of God to save the worst of sinners. And finally, number five, all glory goes to God. So humility, thankfulness, assurance, conversion of the worst of sinners, and in the end, because of this verse, all glory goes to God. As the psalm says, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name, give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. So I'm done, and let me close with this. Jesus does not speak mainly for controversy. He speaks to call sinners. He speaks to humble the proud. And he speaks to get glory for his Father. To call sinners, come, come. If you come, you have life. To humble people like me and to get glory for his Father. Now is the Son glorified, and in him the Father is glorified. That's why I lived, that's why I died, that's why I rose again. So come to him. Be satisfied in him, be humbled by him, and give glory to the Father. Let's pray. Gracious Father, I thank you for saving so many of us by drawing us to Jesus who has life. And I pray that we would be humbled and that we would be thankful and that we would be confident and that we would be boldly evangelistic in our prayers and words. And I pray, O oh God, that we would give you glory. So draw people to yourself. Draw people at the North Campus on Saturday night. Draw people at the North Campus on Sunday morning. Draw people at the downtown campus on Sunday morning. And draw people here now to Christ. I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.